This lecture discusses quantitative content analysis. Content analysis is popular with mass media researchers because it's an effective way to study the content of the media and its messages. Modern content analysis derived from research by the military in World War II. These researchers use content analysis to study the propaganda in support of World War II against Nazi Germany and the Japanese soldiers in the newspapers and radio programs in the United States. Mass media researchers have adopted this method to analyze content in numerous communication tools such as social media platforms, newspapers, radio, television, speeches, videos, websites, or marketing materials. This presentation will cover the following learning objectives. In essence, quantitative content analysis involves the classification of parts of a text through the application of a very structured, systematic coding scheme from which conclusions can be drawn about the message content and its characteristics. By clearly specifying the coding and other procedures, the content analysis is replicable in the sense that other researchers could produce this same study. Content analysis can be carried out quantitatively, but also qualitatively. The big thing to know is that code communication is for certain traits, categories, or meanings. This could be performed on television show transcripts, magazine articles, newspaper articles, photographs, advertisements, motion pictures, videotapes, audio tapes, podcasts, blog posts, Facebook posts, other social media platforms, websites, and the marketing materials. When you're going to describe communication content, the researcher can catalog the characteristics of a given body of communication content at any point in time. And it's potentially identified developments over a long period of time, such as change in society, that can be done longitudinally. And when testing hypotheses, message characteristics, a researcher attempts to relate certain characteristics of the source of the message to the characteristics of the message that's produced or printed. Now for the third purpose, the portrayal of a certain group, phenomenon or trait is assessed against a standard that's taken for real life. The fourth purpose a researcher would assess changes in media policy toward groups portrayed in the media to make inferences about the media's responsiveness to the demands for better coverage or to document social trends. We see this in the coverage of police, military, and LGBTQ um, individuals. Content analysis is a starting point for media effects research. So one of the best known examples is cultivation analysis. Content analysis is also used with agenda setting studies to determine the importance of the news topics as well as the effectiveness of messages and engaging their audiences to perform a certain behavior or to learn something and in essence changing their behavior, attitudes, or knowledge. A content analysis is conducted in a sequence of several steps. And some of these steps can be combined together, but one of the best references for this is from Wimmer and Dominic's Public Relations Research Communications textbook. So we're going to walk through all nine of these steps in the following slides. Content analysis research should be guided by a well-developed research question, questions or hypotheses. A research question can be based on the review of related literature, a theory, prior research, practical problems, or in response to changing societal conditions. An example of a question for your research project could be the following. What are the themes that could be identified from mission statements of colleges of agriculture in the Western region?
What are the similarities and differences in the themes that can be identified in the mission statements of colleges and agriculture? colleges of agriculture in the western region. A well-defined research question assists the researcher in developing the content categories or to discover the data that's valuable in answering the research questions, which also helps in writing the chapter 2 literature review. As a researcher, you'll need to set the perimeters of the body of your content considered for your content analysis. Two characteristics can determine the appropriate universe for your content analysis study. You should determine the topic area and your time period. So your topic area would be a newspaper, television program, radio program, specific websites, social media platforms. Your type period would be over the length of the time that you want to conduct this study. It will be two weeks long because it's a specific online marketing campaign. Maybe six months or one year of media coverage, five years, ten years. It really does depend on the purpose of your study, the access to the content over that time period, and the ability to analyze the number of items that you've identified. It is important, though, that you justify the reason for selecting your topic area and your time period in your Chapter 3. After defining your universe, then you can select your sample. And if you're using a finite number of articles, typically less than 100, then you can do a census of your content. And this provides a great possible representation. However, a census may not be possible in some cases where there's a large volume of media coverage has been analyzed, such as a study over many months or years. And in such a case, a sample of media content can be selected. Sampling does need to be conducted in a very objective way, ensuring reliability is maintained. So many researchers use a sampling technique or strategy because they can't just use the entire population because of time or money constraints or lack of coders. These are just a few of the most common sampling strategies used in content analysis. A systematic random is simply selecting every nth unit from the total population of articles or advertisements or commercials or blog posts for the study. A purposive sample is selecting all the articles from a key media, not necessarily a less important piece of media. But this is valid to provide that there's some basis for this criteria and that that type of media is very important to analyze. Quota, such as selecting a proportion of articles from several regions or areas, geographically, demographically, psychographically, or even subject category based. Stratified sampling uh, has you do constructs by randomly selecting units for analysis, such as articles or blog posts for certain days or weeks over a period of time. For example, if you were doing a marketing campaign or if you had a livestock show during a three-week period of time, you could content analyze all of the Facebook posts that were published during that stock show. Circulation size, you can pick from big city newspapers, medium city newspapers, small city newspapers. You could also pick the type of sources. Maybe you'll do news coverage, women's coverage, men's magazines, or television coverage by a specific network or a program type. And you can even select it by the month and the day of the week. Being clear on your unit analysis and content analysis has really particular implications for selecting your sample strategy. You'll need to decide the unit of text that you're going to classify during your coding process. Terminology varies, so some researchers refer to this as a coding unit. Examples of a unit of analysis include words, phrases, sentences, images, photographs, a whole document, a blog post, a tweet, a Facebook post, and you need to choose your unit of analysis taking into account your research questions and the concepts that you wish to identify in your analysis. The next major step is to develop a coding scheme. 
This is the process of developing classification rules to assign coding units to particular categories or concepts. For example, assigning the numerical code 0 to an advertisement if the central figure is an image of a male and 1 if the image is of a female. The resulting rules are detailed in a code book or a coding manual that specifies how to code and what to code and what all of the numeric codes mean. Two ways exist for establishing your content categories. Emergent coding establishes the categories after the preliminary examination of data. The researcher determines the common factors or themes that have emerged through the data. Emergent coding is the common coding system for qualitative content analysis or items that are open-ended that have been asked in a quantitative content analysis. A researcher would use a priori coding when the categories are already established before collecting the data. A priori coding is done in quantitative content analyses. Your coding scheme may draw on existing ones developed by other researchers or from your theoretical framework or conceptual framework used for your current study. In addition, existing content analysis dictionaries are available to support the analysis of written text. These dictionaries specific, uh, specify a range of concepts and words or phrases and the indicators for those concepts to help you create the categories for coding your content. In preparing your codebook, you have to make sure that each code is exhaustive and mutually exclusive and that your instructions for coding are very clear. This isn't very different than survey methodology if you're familiar with developing survey questions that are mutually exhaustive, mutually exclusive. Mutually exclusive means that you're thinking through all of the different um, ethnicities and listing them out and making sure that they can't pick white Caucasian, white Caucasian, Hispanic, non-Hispanic, and having them maybe be two different categories when they're really the same thing. Exhaustivity is making sure that every unit analysis can be placed in an existing category. Sometimes this is challenging and you will see studies that will use an other category or miscellaneous category and then specify what it is to help with capturing that information when it doesn't fit one of the pre-identified uh, codes. For reliability, different coders should agree that your unit of analysis is placed into the proper category and it's recommended that multiple coders Pre-test the categories on a very small scale of your content, about 10% of the overall sample, also known as a pilot test, before the coding all of the main content. In addition to the code book, you also need to prepare a coding form or a coding schedule. And this is a form that can be used to record all the details of the codes applied to the data during the coding process. That information can then be transferred from a coding form into a software program for further analysis. This can be done on paper and entered into Excel or SPSS. Others will code directly into an SPSS file or a, an Excel file. You do need to establish a quantification system. This helps you think about your data analysis. You have to realize if the information you're coding fits the nominal, interval, or ratio level of measurement. For nominal, a lot of times it's counting the frequency of occurrences within a category. Newspaper section, author type, organizational message type, type of content within extension sustainability, your number of sources, the type of sources. Interval data is usually based on scales that can rate attributes or characteristics, such as rating the level of bias of an author, or maybe the level of sentiment expressed in a Facebook post. 
Rotary ratio data is usually measuring space and time, so the number of column inches, the number of words, commercial minutes. Once your initial coding scheme has been developed, it has to be piloted. This can be done on 10% of your randomly selected sample of your data. Piloting is essentially identifying problems with your coding scheme or your coder's ability to apply it. Any such problems need to be addressed before the study proceeds, and changes can be made to the code book and to the coding sheet to avoid those problems. When your coding scheme is finalized, coding can begin, and whilst coding can be done by a single person, the use of multiple coders allows the principal researcher to see whether the coding scheme can be applied in a reliable way. In addition, if there's large amounts of data, more than one coder is most likely to be needed. Coders need to use standardized code sheets to classify their data by placing check marks on predetermined spaces or by answering open-ended questions on content categories. You can do this in a Word file that is printed and written out with pen or pencil. You can also enter the data into an Excel spreadsheet or an SPSS program to tabulate your data and answer your research questions. Other times, uh, social media posts can be analyzed in Envivo, TechSmart, Profiler Plus, if you want to know more about the audiences or the message characteristics in a qualitative manner. An important additional step for content analysis is reliability testing. Particularly relevant if more than one coder is used in the examination of the consistency between coders. Unless the coding scheme has been applied in such a consistent way, the resulting data um, will be unreliable. This can be tested by getting coders to code the same set of material and then measuring their inter-reader reliability. And again, I usually do about 10% of the sample. One such measure for reporting intercoder reliability is percentage agreement, which is given by a formula where PA, the percentage agreement, is done by the number of agreements divided by the number of segments coded. And unfortunately, there really is no clear agreement on what constitutes as an acceptable level of reliability. So I refer to Noondorf to suggest that scores above 80% would be acceptable in most situations for intercoder reliability. More sophisticated measures can include Cohen's Kappa or Scott's Pi. When you do your initial test of reliability and it is satisfactory so that you get at least all of your coders at 0.80 or higher level of agreement, then you can reanalyze 10 to 25 percent of your data and calculate all your scores and make sure that you're doing well and just continue um, the analysis and kind of spot check things as you go through the data analysis process. Validity is defined as a degree to which an instrument actually measures what it's set out to measure. And in descriptive content analyses, we actually rely on face validity, which means that the categories are rigidly and satisfactorily defined and that the procedures of analysis were adequately conducted and followed. And you can validate this not just with the pilot test, but by having other individuals look at your code book and your coding sheet to see that you've addressed everything needed to be collected. Final analysis involves the application of quantitative techniques. Descriptive statistics, such as frequency counts, can be used to summarize your findings from the sample, and appropriate inferential statistics can be used to test hypotheses that have been formulated 
You can also look at correlations when looking at certain characteristics of message posts and the level of engagement to see if there's a correlation between those and what might be the statistically significant characteristics that lead to higher engagement. When you interpret the results, you need to explain the importance or meaning of the results. You do this by showing how the patterns in your research shed light on your research questions, and if the patterns support findings of other corresponding studies, contradict these studies, or align with the theoretical framework that you've used. This is typically done in chapter four of your thesis or dissertation. If you have any questions or comments about quantitative content analysis, you can reach me through Canvas Inbox or Kelsey Hall at usu.edu. Thank you.